Welcome back, WW Fly Corbair. Here today, we're going to have an overview of some engines. These are pretty popular videos. We're going to go rapid fire through a bunch of engines that are here in the hangar. We'll take a look at them, comment on details, and follow along. It's a pretty good look at a cross section of engines that are currently here and that are typical of builders' current builds. You're going to have to put up with a little bit of airplane noise because we're here at an airport. And you're going to have to put up with a little bit of wind noise because, uh, try as I might, I don't think I can stop the wind. But uh, with those things aside, let's get a good look at this. Engine number one that we're looking at today, Bob DeWinter's 2700cc motor. This is going to power his Peyton Pole project. This is an older build. It's nine years old was run at a very early Barnwell Corvair College. The engine was set up then, but it did not have a fifth bearing. It is returned to the shop to have a fifth bearing installed. This has a very early, inexpensive starter set up on it. Let's get a look at that. This is the original style starters that were based on Subaru EA81 starters. This link bar set the distance between the two. Could be rounded off, could be dressed up some more. But this was the starting point for starters. After this they had an ear and then they gradually moved to the modern 2400L starter. But this was a standard setup. Now the end cover has been taken off and the prop hub is off. This is being upgraded with a Gen 1 fifth bearing. It will be installed, trued up and with the motor completely assembled. That's what a Gen 1 bearing is. Gen 1 bearing on here, prop hub can be shortened to match. Everything's going to end up in the exact same location. Starter's going to be moved forward about three-eighths of an inch. Not, not a difficult conversion. Works with the same ring gear, all the same stuff. We're going to get a front alternator bracket on here for Bob. Let's get another look at some other details on the motor. Come in close right in here. This is an Iridium spark plug. These are the correct spark plugs as shown by the mop manual. Uh, this is important. We're seeing too many engines come back with AC44 plugs in them, or we're seeing them come back with Iridium plugs. If it's a 2700, it's got to have a 20 series plug in it. If it's a 3 liter, it's got to be a 22, and if it's a 3.3, it's got to be a 24. Now you can even bump those colder. 3.3 can run 27 series plugs. You can move a 3 liter to 24 series plugs. Uh, 20s uh, seem pretty good in this. We were originally running 16s. You can run them really cold, and the engine has great resistance to detonation and actually runs cooler. Let's take a look at this. This is a standard set of reboard Corvair cylinders. If you look at it, in nine years they have a little bit of light rust on there. You can repaint this if you like externally, but it does give you an indication that you should do a good job painting the cylinders when you put the motor together in the first place. Going around, it has uh, underneath the spark plugs has copper washers. We do not use the original washers that come on the iridium plugs. Again, all in the mop manual on how to install this. Some nice powder coated valve covers. The two breather lines here. That's the vent line and that is the oil return line. A uh, set of traditional Corvair clamps, all powder coated. Moving around here, let's take a look at the back of the engine. This is the standard. Corvair oil pump. This may or may not have to be upgraded. Probably needs a high volume pump now that it's getting a fifth bearing. Let's move in here and take a look. This is where the gold oil filter housing goes on the motor. And if you look right down in there, there's a bug that we're going to have to scoop out of there. All right, no more, your, your career's over, bug. Uh, this is where the oil cooler bypass goes right here. If you're going to have a gold sandwich adapter, that is removed. If you're going to have a regular General Motors oil cooler, that has to be there. Again, covered in manuals. Quick, quick thing we picked up here. Uh, fuel pump uh, bushing that uh, ran the, the guide rod through here. The bushing is missing. This motor will have a tiny oil leak on the back of the balancer. So we're going to insert a bushing right there to seal it off. If you buy an HV2000 uh, rear oil accessory case from me, it comes with that part already done. Bob did this piece himself a couple of years ago, uh, a decade ago, and missed that detail. So that's going to get corrected while he's here. 
continuing to move around. Uh, this has uh, an original style uh, distributor clamp on it, and that does have an MS nut, and that is correct. Uh, we want people to catch that. I don't want to see any straight nuts on these things. Uh, always a locking nut, and that MS nut right there is uh, an excellent choice. Taking a look, here is a standard EP distributor. Uh, that's, the, that's the electronic side right there, that's the point side right there. Uh, this is all set up and ready to go. This is straight from us, and that is an EP. If it had the plug on the end of it, it would be an EPX. But uh, the EPXs have the uh, uh, weather pack connector. Again, uh, a set of powder coated valve covers, uh, oil filler in here in the neck. What a lot of people miss when I say you put the oil in here rather than in the top cover. Top cover has got a uh, storm of oil going on almost nothing here. You look at these details like this and people say oh I'm gonna put my oil filler somewhere else or I'm gonna do it a little differently. There are reasons why we do this stuff. I can walk up to somebody's motor put my finger through here and actually touch the rocker on here. Don't need to take the spark plug out to find out which stroke we're on. I can touch that rocker right there look at and hold the propeller and rotate this around. If the mark on the balancer moves the rocker just when it's about uh, eight degrees before top dead center, the cam timing's correct. I can actually tell that without even taking a valve cover off. If I'm going to do a uh, distributor setup, I don't need to remove the number one spark plug. I can tell what stroke it's on with my finger right there. So, little details that may not seem obvious when you're checking out a motor, uh, or this stuff doesn't seem to make sense if you're new, let me tell you, that's uh, all involved in great detail. As we uh, come around here, again, this is a very early starter, uh, and uh, somewhere between now and the end of the week, I'm going to talk Bob into something a little more modern. Uh, there's a set of hybrid studs there and a safety shaft. The original hybrid studs and the safety shaft work with a fifth bearing. Gets installed right over the top of it. That was an original Clark's uh, uh, fail-safe gear uh, with the lock ring on it. It's sort of an outmoded piece. That's now been outsourced to China. We have a different uh, cam gear that we use these days. But this one still works because this is when they were still made in the United States. Uh, motor in excellent condition for having been stored for a decade. Uh, oil pan is off to do a good job installing the fifth bearing and then uh, the hub and then we're going to put the oil pan on the bottom. Uh, motor has been stored properly that it's been carefully taped off uh, down below. Again, you can swing right in here and get a look at this cylinder. You can dress these up a little bit later with a little careful masking and a little painting. But again, uh, this is why we paint cylinders beforehand. That's not excessive rust, it's just, a, uh, uh, it's just a cosmetic issue. But we like the motors to look good at the same time. So with that, uh, let's move on to the next motor. Here's engine number two. This is a three liter Corvair. This is a very, very nice build with a billet crankshaft, billet rods, all the best of stuff inside it. This 120 horsepower Corvair. Its natural home is in a Zenith 750. Owner sent it in for a tune-up. Uh, the engine uh, here has uh, the best of components. When we take a look at the details on this motor, remember that it's on the test stand. So if you see wiring that looks like this, this stuff lives on the test stand. This is uh, the ignition cap and a lot of the wires. It's just instrumentation for the test stand. I've taken the cooling shroud off the top. A lot of the motor, as you see it, is being evaluated right here. When it's installed uh, on the aircraft, it will have its own stainless steel exhaust system. We have a cast iron exhaust manifolds leading to a uh, muffler so that it runs quietly and we can hear it on the stand. Again, uh, normal configuration motor here. Uh, let's uh, come on in and get a look at some details right in here. Uh, right there is the smaller size uh, valve cover uh, clamps that we've used for the last couple of years. If you take a look right there, there's a proper head nut right there. When you look at it and it's black and it leaves a black mark on your fingers, that's ARP Ultra Torque Thread Lubricant, which is the appropriate thread lubricant. That's a grade 9 tall uh, cylinder head nut. Uh, that is correct. If you want to take a look at what good aluminum welding looks like, right there is a uh, sample. This is a set of SPA prepped heads. Uh, this is a, uh, the welded on aluminum tubes leaned in was something we developed 
uh, this particular pattern uh, 15 years ago, and all the engines have had those. People have looked at it endlessly. Some people have debated it, but that is the configuration that works. Uh, it is held in place with a uh, hose clamp where it uh, transitions from the stainless steel super thin wall uh, intake manifold to the aluminum head pipe right there. Uh, system works. You can get fancier clamps if you like, but uh, those have been proven uh, their value. Let's take a look at what engine, what plug is in here. Uh, come on around there. Uh, see that right there? That's an iridium. Uh, see the number on it? It's a 24. Uh, the Iridium 24 is appropriate for a 3 liter. Again, uh, no hotter of a plug. As the number gets bigger, the cooler the plug. So you either want to have a 24 in this motor, or you may even consider a 27 if you live in a challenging area. If you take a look at this, this is an SPA cylinder kit right here. We're about to have a flyby by an airplane. Uh, we'll give it a two second break. This, uh, again, this is the three liters have their own cylinders. They are not Corvair cylinders. The heads and the cases are machined to take that. These are uh, dressed up nicely. They have uh, brand new head studs on them. And that configuration works. Shoot in from this way for a second. This is a 2400L starter. Uh, this is uh, the modern starter and you can see how much smaller this is than uh, what was originally shown on uh, the first engine right there. Again, this type of wiring right here, this lives on the test stand. This is not wiring for the gentleman's airplane. Uh, coming out front, short gold prop hub, uh, regular uh, solid ring gear. Uh, come on around this side for a moment. Get it in the daylight. As you come around, uh, that is an SPA fifth bearing. Important detail right here that we have on 2400L starters is they must have that grounding link right there. That link stabilizes the entire operation and that is correct. We have a separate video on that. If you take a look at that, that's a short gold hub right there. Here's our test stand prop. Uh, it is actually 58 inches in diameter. It's a warp drive and it is a ground run only prop. A lot of people look at this and misinterpret it as a flight prop. Uh, we use the same brand of props, but these props are smaller on test stands. The reason why is I need to be able to run the engine up to 3400 RPM so I can check its entire range of flight characteristics. I do not want to have a prop that statics like it would static on your airplane at maybe 27, 2800 RPM because then I would not know what the engine is doing at 3000 to 3300. So that's what the prop diameter is. And also, if you've seen me at a Corbair College, the engine can go in the trailer with the prop on it. Somebody said, why does it have that specific shape? And if you looked at it, it'll clear the door if it's held diagonally like that. There's a reason for everything. Come on in and let's get a good look. Again, the smaller valve cover clamps on a set of uh, uh, powder-coated valve covers. The dark look on the stud is actually the ARP lubricant. Uh, that is the grade 9 nut. Again, uh, the three liter cylinders on this motor, and internally this motor is built with a billet crank and uh, billet rods. The billet cranks that come from SPA are first class units. The billets for them are Timken billets that are made in the United States. The cranks themselves are made here in the United States. There have been zero failures on these crankshafts in their 10 year lifespan. They are excellent, excellent products, and consider that they are worked harder in SPA Panthers than any other aircraft. So, right there is a quality, quality crankshaft. No imported junk here. Come on in and let's get another look. Right here is the run stands instrumentation. That hose, this hose, this is all run stand stuff. I have this clear hose to tell what the level of oil in the valve cover is, right off there. Uh, we have separate information about making sure that your uh, push rod is centered in the lifter. That tells me whether or not it was done. If I didn't build the motor myself, I need to be able to see that. Right there's the regular vent line. As you come down here, that's a cast iron exhaust log from a car. That's not a flight system. This system right here leads to run the air fuel uh, meter that we have on the stand. Down below is our traditional MA3 SPA carburetor. MA3 SPA, specifically the 10-4894, is a Cessna 150 carburetor. 
It is our main unit that we have used for years on these engines. Just now we're getting to using Rotec TVIs, and they work also, and they have particular advantages. But the backbone of the program has been done with MA3 SPAs. Excellent carburetor. Right on the side it says Marvell Chevler Aircraft, and right underneath it it has a cast-in propeller. Uh, the reason why these aren't uh, used in more uh, cheap applications is they cost money, but good performance costs money. Uh, if you are shopping for a slightly more budget carburetor than a Rotec, but for God's sake, don't use anything that came originally on a motorcycle. Uh, motorcycle carburetors are great for motorcycles. They're not for airplanes. So if you take a look at this, uh, coming around here, this is all test stand stuff. All the wiring back here is part of the instrumentation package. Right here you see a Fram oil filter. This is a ground run only item. We run K&Ns or Mobile Ones uh, in the flight configuration. But if I'm just breaking in it on the ground, the $4 Fram filter works just great. That right there is the sandwich adapter and that's because this motor has a super heavy duty oil cooler sitting right here in the flight configuration. On the test stand we don't run oil coolers. Uh, oil, we want the oil to warm up quickly and we have plenty of cooling air over the motor so it doesn't require an oil cooler uh, to uh, keep below the threshold of uh, really too hot. Take a look down in this zone right there. Uh, that is an adjustable oil pressure regulator that we use on some Corvairs. Down below it is my high volume oil pump setup. You can always tell it because it's got a one piece billet aluminum housing on it. That's part of the HV2000. Uh, little oil block off there. The block off tells you uh, that's a series 2800, uh, 2803 part right there. The uh, aftermarket oil cooler, the large one, would sit right here. That's why we have a gold sandwich adapter. That's the standard gold oil filter housing right there. This line right here is a flight item. It will feed the fifth bearing. This again right here, that's just instrumentation. This loop of a hose right here is to put the oil back into the motor. If it was going to the oil cooler, this would be the outlet and that would be the return. Uh, moving along. Let's take a look at this side of the uh, stand. Uh, right there is an Innovate air fuel meter. This is a very high-end gauge. Right there, reads out digitally when the engine's running. Right over here is the second one that reads the opposite bank of cylinders. Uh, just because uh, I'm kind of uh, that kind of guy, we uh, have a uh, Hurst four-speed shifter uh, for a throttle arrangement on on the uh, uh, test stand. Test stand has seen over 500 motors run on it. And there's a look, there's the other oxygen sensor on the other side. This little strap right here is a ground strap to make absolutely sure that all the oxygen sensor components are grounded for the most accurate instrumentation. So, simple industrial setup has tested a lot of motors. What makes a difference on it is what we teach people and what they know about it. It doesn't have to be sophisticated looking to gather quality data. Let's go on and take a look at engine number three. The engine number three represents a little bit of a different story. This engine was built uh, by a builder of ours. Uh, it took about uh, six or seven years to put it together. It was actually test run at a Corbair College. Finished, he brought it home, installed it on his airplane. Uh, the airplane was the Zenith 750 stole. Uh, uh, got in too much of a hurry and did not have good transition training. His transition training was not a plus. To show you that transition training is important, but good transition training is the only one that counts, uh, he went to a, a place, uh, uh, we'll just call it buzzing around for uh, transition training, came home, very first flight, signed off after the transition training, very first flight in the airplane, excessive rate of sink, knocked the wheel off, folded the mains, and prop struck the motor and totaled the airplane. The entire length, length of time on this motor is 45 minutes for one flight. It took six or seven years to build it. It took an awful lot of money. Uh, you've got to make good decisions in aviation, and your training is critically important, not just on your engine, but your training for how you fly your aircraft. 
So, check out who you're going to for transition training. You're not just checking a box, you're making a difference on whether or not your airplane provides decades of enjoyment ahead of you or one single flight traded in and then your insurance company comes and takes the thing away from you. The uh, aircraft engine right here, it can be rebuilt. It's got a prop strike on it so it's going to be torn down. Our mock manual covers every detail of how you take care of a prop strike. This engine was sold on the internet. The guy selling it was an insurance salvage guy. He put a dial indicator on the prop hub and said, oh, it has nine thousandths of an inch run out, but it's a car engine. That's probably how they're made. I will assure you that that prop hub is made more accurately than the prop hub that is an integral part of a Lycoming crankshaft. Whenever you see somebody putting a dial indicator on an engine that's had a prop strike to determine whether or not they're going to do anything, that person doesn't know what they're talking about. You can ask any actual real aviation professional. A prop strike is serious business and there's engine manufacturers recommendations on what to do. Anybody who tells you a story like if you just hit dirt with it, it doesn't matter. Or if they say it had a wooden prop on it, it doesn't matter. My friend Arnold Holmes, Avmec LLC, frequently gives the lectures on behalf of the FAA on what the manufacturer's recommendations are for a prop strike on a motor. And I will assure you, neither Continental nor Lycoming nor William Wynn at Fly Corvair will tell you you put a dial indicator on here and that makes it all perfect to sell to somebody else. Fortunately, a good guy picked this motor up. He understands we're going to take the entire thing down. This motor is an excellent candidate for a rebuild. But quite frankly, it's likely to get a whole new crankshaft. Crankshaft in this case, about a thousand bucks. What's the appropriate thing to do? Probably throw it away. But there's an awful lot of good stuff here, and there's some messed up details. So let's take a look at this. This engine was finished in 2019, late, late in 2019. Yet it exhibits all types of characteristics that tell me that the builder who assembled it wasn't really paying attention to updates on this. So let's just start in and I'll tell you that there are lots of details on this that don't make any sense. That right there is to drive a tachometer. The actual piece that we use to drive the tachometer is smaller than a AAA flashlight battery. This is a colossal piece right here with a giant steel nut on it. Uh, that is an anti-lock brake sensor. This is a ridiculous piece to have on an airplane and a ridiculous bracket right there. I've never shown anybody to put something like that on. The nut again right there is not the standard one that was shipped with it. Take a look at the prop hub right here. Do you see the scuff marks on it right there? And the imprint. This had a warp drive prop on it. I will tell you right now that that prop was actually loose on the front end of the hub. It, that's what leaves that rotational scuffing mark right there. That's not from the hit on the ground and breaking the blades off. That right there is because the prop hub was not properly torqued to the engine's prop hub. Uh, coming around in some details right here, let's take a look at that. In the last motor we saw what the actual link looks like. This is a grounding strap. Very, very briefly we had grounding straps, but we went to the link. There's a video on the link. We tell everybody how to do it. It's all uh, laid out very carefully. But this motor did not have it. Uh, that is considered uh, leaving out something critical. That nut right there is not the nut that was shipped in the hardware kit with this. Uh, we don't use hardware that looks like that in those locations. Again, if you have a question, you ask us. There's the fifth bearing oil hose. This motor is a 2700 uh, with 20 over cylinders on it. That is a Waysman uh, Gen 2 fifth bearing right there. If you take a look at the baffling on the front here, uh, the aluminum baffling kit, sure, that's right out of the catalog, but the strips that are just stuck on here uh, at uh, odd angles, you can go back to our cooling video. No uh, rubber baffling looks like this on a Corvair. It is stuck forward and seals to the cowling when the cowling inflates it with the incoming air. This type of thing just scuffing backwards like that, uh, that's just how you're going to overheat the engine. I do not know why somebody would take the time to build an airplane and not follow the directions on that. Let's take a look at this side right here. Again, 
Uh, this says Corvair 110 horsepower. That's just a set of valve cover stickers on this particular motor. It's actually a 100 horsepower motor. It has the uh, early style valve cover clamps, not the small triangles that we like to see. It does have a heavy duty oil cooler. Uh, and that's uh, correctly installed right here. But for some reason, the builder uh, used the wrong hose end right there. That's to be a 90 degree hose end. Again, the uh, hose is just for its shipping here. Uh, but right there, uh, that right there, I can feel that. That's a, uh, uh, that's a heater hose from a car, and that's not fuel tolerant. Uh, again, uh, ridiculously oversized uh, clamps on that. Coming back around. Can you catch that detail right there? Uh, that right there is a high volume oil pump, but it's an off-brand one made in China for Clark's Corvairs. Uh, those are little castings. You can see that it is actually wet. It's because it has two sets of gaskets in it, something you don't actually need. Uh, the HV2000 uh, uh, rear oil cases that we sell have an integrated CNC'd one-piece uh, uh, self-aligning uh, system on it. This is kind of... Uh, this was okay for a car in the 70s, maybe. Uh, again, intake manifold was taken off of this. Uh, you can look at these nuts and washers. They are not the correct ones. There are thin nuts that are to be applied there and not taken off. Uh, the outer nuts right here, uh, the type of locking nut, that would probably be okay. Let's keep moving around here. Uh, let's get a good look right there. Right here is an easy thing to see that's an error. You see that? That hose end right there, that is an actual Earl's swivel seal hose end. See how the difference in the size and the shape of it right there is? I have no idea what brand of hose end that is. That could be Chinese or whatever. Why you would have one correct one and one incorrect one, beyond me. But that's how this was installed. So, Earl's hose ends and Earl's hose. Again, this can all be corrected, but it needn't have been assembled that way at any time. Uh, taking a look at this right here, this is a uh, EPX distributor. It looks to uh, be in regular shape. There is the correct nut. Let me see if I can swing that into daylight. That is the correct MS nut on the distributor clamp right there. So that's okay. Coming around, uh, this is the uh, very large tachometer wiring and some other stuff uh, stuck for the sensors on the bottom. Uh, again, if you come around, all the baffling in the motor needs to look like this, where the rubber sheets go and lean on the inside of the cowling. Why that was not carried around here, how it was correct here, but somehow decided that it needed to be different here, uh, don't really have an answer for that. Uh, again, this is a 2400L starter. I want to point out that that is not actually an airworthy nut right there. Uh, that is uh, not the uh, standard equipment that this came with. So you take a look at all the details on this. Some of the stuff's okay. That's just the lift clamp for the motor right there. This does have uh, Clark's uh, cylinders on it. That's an aftermarket Clark cylinder, but it is, again, uh, 2700. Now, I'm going to turn this around so we get a little bit better look at it. Right there, let's take a look. better look on this one right there okay this airplane flew and did its one and only flight in December of 2019 at that point for five years we had been telling people not to use that spark plug somebody will say well your old book said it was okay well this incorporates lots of changes that we've done since the old book and do you want the plug that was just okay back then or do you want the actual plug that our research and testing says gives you the best motor possible. Why somebody won't change a spark plug to the correct heat range spark plug, uh, kind of beyond me. Again, doesn't make the guy who did this a bad human being. Don't get me wrong. The guy who did this just listened to voices that everybody kind of hears a little bit. Could have as easily been one of you guys if you listen to the lesser voices around you and you give in to uh, doing things the cheaper expedient way. We have the right way to do all this stuff lined out. Uh, I wanna show it to people, I want people to practice it. You can have a great time flying or you can have 40 minutes in the air just once. Don't 
make these kinds of mistakes. So there you have it, a look at three engines. Things to emulate and mistakes not to be repeated. We have all the training, parts, and information available to you. Please take advantage of it. If you like content like this, please remember to subscribe to the channel. We appreciate your support. And thanks for tolerating a little bit of wind noise today and a little bit of airplane noise. WW Fly Corvair. We'll see you out on the flight line.